When does that happen in Vancouver? The clouds even realize that we need to just take a break and focus on poverty reduction. Thank you, clouds. We're brought here today with a common goal, working to create a poverty-free BC. We're here because we believe that it's possible and we won't stop until it happens. My name is Paul Taylor. I'm the co-chair of the BC Poverty Reduction Coalition alongside Anastasia. I'm also the director, thank you. Someone knows Gordon Neighborhood House. I'm also the director of Gordon Neighborhood House in the West End. But most importantly, I'm someone that dreams in color and refuses to believe and act as if poverty is inevitable. Political action on poverty is possible. It's needed, it's urgent, people are suffering right now. This rally, as you know, marks the end of a week of events which have highlighted the depths of poverty and inequality in BC and the need for provincial candidates and their parties to commit to a comprehensive poverty reduction strategy. As we know, BC remains the only province without a poverty reduction plan. Despite, shame, shame, shame. Despite having the second highest poverty rate in Canada. That's almost 600,000 British Columbians living in poverty each and every day. This is an absolute disgrace. I want to thank everyone again for being here today and the work that you do each and every day. Uh, a couple things to get us started, a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, I'm here with uh, Liz Kellen, uh, joins me here today doing ASL interpretation. Thank you so much, Liz. There is a sign making station over there and uh, you're encouraged to take a selfie with your message once you've made a sign. Unfortunately, I'm sorry we don't provide the selfie sticks, but I'm sure you can make do. Um, also, you can uh, sign postcards to the Premier. I hear she loves getting our mail, so make sure you, you take a moment to do that. There are accessible washrooms, accessible washrooms in the library, including a gender-neutral one on the second floor. There is a tent over here with chairs for anyone that needs one. Um, just go on down that way. Our accessibility point person today is Omar Chu. If you have any questions or concerns, please see him just to my right. The hashtag for today's rally, if you're active on Twitter, is Poverty Free BC. Please tweet, share, and keep the dialogue going uh, on social media. I'd now like to introduce my new friend, um, Gordon August, a hereditary chief from the Seychelles First Nation. Seychelles First Nation. First off, I'd like to acknowledge the three host nations, Musgrim, Skohomish, and Swaletut, with the unceded land that we stand on. I am also a visitor here to this land. I come from Sushal, which is Seashell, up on the Sunshine Coast. I'm here to do a song before the rally starts and everybody gets up and talks. Uh, what is happening and standing together in unity with all the other grassroots that are here today. I raise my hands to everybody that we all stand together in solidarity. By standing together, we're all one. We're not just one voice, we become many voices. The song I'm going to sing to you is created by my grandfather, my great, 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 great grandfather back in 1820 when he brought someone into his, into the circle when he met his woman. So this song has been passed on to eight generations in our family and kept alive. Now my grandchildren carry the song today and many other people in Vancouver that know me from other active, being an active in Fight C, Site C, Climate Convergence, Affordable Housing, and Homelessness, and it's group of the 60s. So with no further ado, I'm going to sing the song, but I'm not going to use the mic. Oh,
that uh, really needs no introduction. Uh, she's a tireless advocate for a more just and fair society. She, like many not too long ago, participated in the Welfare Food Challenge organized by our friends at Raise the Rates to help highlight the inadequacy of BC's stagnant welfare rate. I'm very proud to introduce the president of the BC Federation of Labor, Irene Lanzinger. today, well not really my pleasure because it's time we solve poverty, but I want to add the voices of the 500,000 members of the BC Federation of Labour to the call for a poverty reduction plan now. About 10 days ago, the Liberal government introduced a budget, and that budget did not include an increase to welfare rates. Minister of Finance, Mike DeYoung, and the Premier, Christy Clark, were asked about that. They said the reason it didn't include an increase in welfare rates was because they were going to find jobs for people on welfare. And I thought, are you kidding me? Either you have no idea about people who live in poverty, or you don't care. And I suspect it's both. For one thing, a job in this province does not lift you out of poverty. There are 500,000 people who work for less than $15 an hour. They work and live in poverty. And that is a shame. Secondly, there are people on welfare who unfortunately have multiple barriers 
to finding a job or getting a job. They deserve respect. They deserve dignity. They deserve a welfare rate that lifts them out of poverty that they can live on. And that is not $610 a month. So we need a poverty reduction plan and we need it now. And that plan has to include a very substantial increase to welfare rates. It has to include a $15 minimum wage, at least. It has to include a child care plan, a $10 a day child care plan, because that will help working families too. It has to include funding for public education, for health care, for social services, for that social safety net that helps our vulnerable. Those are the things we must have in a poverty reduction plan. Every single province in this country has a poverty reduction plan except BC. And in Saskatchewan, they put a poverty reduction plan in place because the medical community came to the government, Brad Wall, one of the most right-wing conservative premiers in the country, put in place a poverty reduction plan because the medical community said to him, poverty costs us too. And it is cheaper to have a poverty reduction plan than let people grow up in poverty. Poverty costs us. It costs us in our education system. It costs us in our health care system. It costs us in our criminal justice system. It costs us in our public services system. It costs us. And even though we should have a poverty reduction plan because we are compassionate, because we care about people, we should also have a poverty reduction plan because it makes economic sense to have one. There, no, the Premier would like you to believe that everybody working for $15 an hour or less is a kid living in their parents' basement. And I want to tell you that there are 70,000 people over the age of 55 years of age that work for less than $15 an hour. 70,000 over 55. There are 36,000 single women who live in poverty in their senior years. One in five children in this province grows up in poverty. And that is not good for anyone. So we have to solve this problem. We can solve this problem. We can have a poverty-free BC. It requires that we elect a government that understands what happens when people live in, live in poverty and puts in plan a place to end that poverty. And we have a chance to do that on May 9th. Vote for a government that's going to give us a poverty reduction plan. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Irene. I think I've got one of the easiest jobs of the day, introducing people that uh, don't need introductions, but here I am. It's with great honor that I introduce an incredibly inspirational leader and a bold anti-poverty advocate. Please join me in welcoming the president of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, Grand Chief Stuart Phillip. Why has Kahal? He's next seal. That's Greece. I'll see you. I want to begin, as is our custom, to acknowledge the Leowatu, Squamish, and Musqueam. And I want to express my deep gratitude to the kind invitation from the BC Fed to be here to stand in solidarity with all of you, to um, give our highly visible, our voice to the outrageous, absolutely outrageous policies of the Christie Clark government and its contribution to the crushing poverty that the vast majority of British Columbians 
are forced to endure on a daily basis. We all know that this province has suffered greatly. The people of the province of British Columbia have suffered under 15, 16 years of BC Liberal government policy and legislation. The provincial debt has absolutely ballooned to the most incredible levels that we've ever seen. And we know that this government is completely and totally beholden to the multinational, transnational corporate community at the expense, at the absolute expense of our children and families throughout this entire province. And we have an opportunity on May 9th to do as we did with the Harper government and to come out in unprecedented numbers and vote the Clark government out of office. I do not doubt for a moment this is one of the most important elections in the entire history of the province of British Columbia. There's a lot riding on this election and um, it has become so tragic that on a daily basis we witness the death, the needless death of so many people as a consequence of the failure of the policies, the legislative framework. Uh, for example, the Ministry of Children and Family Development is in complete disarray. Children in care have suffered grievously. There's been um, a terrible number of deaths as a result of the negligence on the part of the MCFD. The Union of BC Indian Chiefs, along with a lot of other groups, have called for the resignation of Minister Kandu. Kandu, on countless occasions, Premier Clark stands beside Minister Kandu and says that there's really nothing wrong and that the province is addressing these issues. We all know that's not true. Our medical system in the province of British Columbia, being one of the most expensive, is one of the most incompetent. The wait times have uh, continued to increase in length, and incredibly, people are dying in the waiting rooms, literally dying in the waiting rooms and in the hallways of um, terribly understaffed hospitals in spite of the heroic efforts on the part of our healthcare workers, our brothers and sisters that have dedicated their life's work to the well-being of, of all of us. And we can't stand idly by, and we can't just simply complain and become incredibly articulate at expressing the warts and pimples and the lesions on the face of the Clark government, rather we have to take action. We have to organize, 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 and we have to get our people out to the polls on May 9th and kick this, this worst government in the history of the province of British Columbia out of office and replace it. We need to replace it with a government that has a different vision that has a different approach, an approach that's inclusive, an approach that's caring, an approach that, that focuses on human values, human rights, the rights of people, the rights of workers, and ensure that all of our families have the means, the fundamental means to meet the needs of their children, the educational needs, the health needs, and in order to do that, we're going to have to ensure that workers are paid a decent wage. As it exists now, we all know that that's not the case. There's a reason that this province leads in the uh, poverty across this country, particularly child poverty, and it's the absolute negligence of the Clark government, and it's their obsession with market debt initiatives like LNG, the, um, 
the Saint Sea Down, Milu Island, the heavy oil pipeline proposals, they are clearly in the pocket of the big corporations and we have to change that. And so I want to thank each and every one of you for taking time away from your families, from your loved ones, from your Saturday afternoon to come out and stand shoulder to shoulder, to stand in solidarity for the veterans in the crowd that have been at this for the last 20 to 40, 50 years. I hold my hands up to you. I thank you for your lifelong commitment and dedication to, to all of our sisters and brothers. To those of you that are newcomers, I thank you for your interest. I thank you for knowing and understanding that we do have a duty of care to each other. We do have that, that obligation to hold one another up so that we can enjoy the, the sacred blessing of life from our Creator and to enjoy a life that we all have a right to expect in one of the most prosperous uh, regions in the Western Hemisphere. So with that, I just want to end by saying there's going to be a multitude of rallies and demonstrations unfolding in the next uh, few months. And I urge all of you to take the time to be there. We have a campaign in front of us, and a campaign is a campaign is a campaign. That means that we need to sacrifice our time, and we need to be visible, we need to be loud, and we need to be bold, and we need to speak what's in our hearts and our minds for the sake of our children and our grandchildren. Why? Citizens for Accessible Neighborhoods, Heather McCain. The enforced poverty of those with disabilities in our province is shameful. Even with the two small rate raises the government doled out last year and this year, people with disabilities are living hundreds of dollars below the poverty line. MLA Michael DeJong stated that, quote, the measure of any society is reflected in the degree to which it is willing to help the most vulnerable, end quote. If that is what our government believes, they are failing and they must work to remedy it. We need a poverty reduction plan. We need action. We need a proper rate increase. Citizens for Accessible Neighborhoods is currently working on a report called Sharing Our Realities, Life on Provincial Disability in British Columbia, based on a survey from last winter. A survey in which people on disability rates shared what it is like to live well below the poverty line. Frank, who is on disability, says, quote, I have to believe that most people don't understand how bad it is. The alternative, that they understand and they choose to leave it like it is, is unthinkable to me. The message is that we don't have enough for basics like food and shelter, and this makes our disabilities worse. We are losing our health, we are losing our homes, we are losing our lives. This is a crisis, end quote. We must do better. We must have the proper supports in place for people with disabilities, for our citizens living well below the poverty line. Our system is making people's health worse. It is causing depression and anxiety and it is leading people to contemplate and or attempt suicide. When you live in poverty, it is hard to think of anything else. Ryan states, quote, life is a living hell to say the least. This is not an exaggeration in any way. Hell is the depression you fall into with little or no way out. Hell is having to decide between eating today and paying your rent or maybe paying your utility bill. Hell is getting sicker and sicker as time goes on from poor diets and the inability to afford the high cost of healthy choices. Hell is fighting every day for that one little reason to keep living and knowing that tomorrow might be the day that you lose control and end your life." End quote. People with disabilities deserve better. We deserve dignity. We deserve basic health and nutrition. 
we deserve to see ourselves included in a poverty reduction plan that includes rates that are indexed to inflation so we don't have to wonder every year if we have to stretch the same amount to growing inflation and increased rates like hydro. Disability can happen to anyone at any time and if you become disabled, you will want the proper social supports and services in place. You will want rates that allow you the basics of life, basic health, basic nutrition, basic housing, basic dignity. Fight with us to improve the lives of British Columbians with disabilities. Mishi stated, quote, life with a disability is harder than it needs to be. With proper supports, we wouldn't have to be living in fear, isolation, and poverty. We just need people to listen. We need people to be willing to help us make changes for the better. We can contribute to society, and we do. But we can do more. We just need people to be willing to see what is going on and to listen to the experiences and concerns of those who live this reality every single day, end quote. The British Columbia government has stated they want to be the most progressive province in all of Canada for people with disabilities. Well, it's time to act. Yeah. To move from promises of goals to actually working to achieve that goal with long-term solutions. A poverty reduction plan that includes a proper rate increase is an excellent place to start. Thank you, Heather. Also, um, you know, we're gathered here and we're all really excited about the possibility for action on poverty. We all recognize the need for a poverty reduction strategy. We're long overdue. It's really great to see um, uh, so many folks here, especially um, the leader of the opposition, uh, John Horgan. And several MLAs. I think what people are asking for loud and clear is we're asking for um, action, political action on poverty. So I encourage you, um, folks who have come out today, to make sure to collect, connect with our, with our MLAs and our elected officials to demand just that. Our next speaker is someone who has lived the reality of our deeply inadequate welfare rates and is a tireless advocate in these issues with the Carnegie Community Action Project. I am delighted to welcome my friend and hero, Fraser Stewart. I lived on welfare for three and a half years. I lived on welfare for three and a half years. That was basic welfare of $610. It hasn't changed in 10 years. This April, it will be 10 years since the rates have gone up. Over 600,000 BC people are living in poverty. That's about the same population as Vancouver, the largest city in British Columbia. Every one of those are living in poverty. We have a bunch of kids here. Think of that. One of, one of those five kids is going to go to bed hungry tonight. When you're living on $610 and you have to pay rent, you have to buy food, you have to buy bus tickets. You have to pay for a cell phone. You have to buy stamps. Because when you're on welfare, basic welfare, you are supposed to be able to look for work. To look for work, you have to buy a cell phone. Most people buy a cell phone and they have minutes on it. They buy a card. It's about 60 cents a minute. You have to send out your resume, so you need stamps. That's another $15, $20 a month. The average rent for an SRO in Vancouver is about $480. The, minute, the rest, the government gives you $375 for rent. The rest of it comes out of your, your basic allowance for food. And yet, our Minister of Housing has said that we're three times better off than people living in third world countries. 
I'm telling you, we are in a bloody third world country. We've got people living in tents, 4,000 of them, 4,000 of them right now, and Vancouver is not even counting yet. So that's pretty well third, country, third world country. Our premier keeps on saying we have the best economy in Canada. For who? I think we need a new yardstick on how to measure economy. And I'm going to be a little bit contrary here. We don't need a poverty reduction plan. We need a poverty elimination plan. Thank you. Thank you for again, someone else that needs no introduction. The rally would be, it, it just wouldn't be the same without the person I'm about to introduce, and it certainly would be a whole lot quieter if we didn't have him here. I have the pleasure of introducing another friend and important voice in this work. To know him is to know that he's, he is a passionate activist that is never too shy to speak about the cruelty of the Christy Clark regime. It is with pleasure that I introduce the Raise the Rates organizer and my friend Bill Hopwood. Thank you. When I grew up in this city, there were no food banks. There were not people sleeping on every street corner, and there were very few people panhandling. Now, BC is a much richer province, and yet we have food banks everywhere. We have people sleeping on the streets. We have people panhandling everywhere. What happened? The politicians decided to create mass poverty in British Columbia. They set the tax rates, they set the minimum wage, they set welfare rates, they decide not to build social housing. They decide to leave basic welfare frozen for 10 years. Minister Stilwell said about welfare, she recognized it would be challenging to live on $610 a month. It is not challenging, it is impossible. But there was one group of people that this government thought were challenged, the 1%. They gave to each individual member of the 1% $41,000 every year in tax cuts. They must have been struggling because they needed $41,000. That's more than the average worker earns in BC in a year. So it's a political choice to create poverty. They also, if you add all that up, they gave away $3 billion in tax cuts. If we had that money in the public purse, our schools would not be stretched, welfare would be increased, we could afford to look after our young children and all the other issues. So hopefully, on May the 10th, those tax cuts will be reversed and we get that money back in the public purse. Basically, raise the rates did a skit a while ago of the Premier marrying Mr. 1%. This government is married to the 1%. Irene talked about the cost of poverty. I'll give you the money. Poverty costs BC $8 billion a year. Fixing it costs $4 billion a year for that welfare raising, raising the minimum wage, building 10,000 units of social housing, $10 a day childcare. It would save $4 billion a year and we'd be a much healthier and happy province. Why does this government waste $4 billion? Because poverty benefits somebody. It benefits big business. The terrible welfare rates frighten workers to put up with crap jobs because the alternative is worse. A low minimum wage holds down other workers' wages. So even if you're in a union job, this government's poverty increase plan threatens your living standards. 
I said the politicians make poverty. But I'll tell you something else. Movements make change. Everything that we value was created by mass movements. When people said women should have the vote, everybody said ridiculous. When people said workers should have a weekend, we were told it would destroy the economy. Movements created those things and we, we didn't call for one woman in ten to have a vote. One worker in ten to have a weekend. We said all workers get a weekend. The same with poverty. I will agree with Fraser. We need a plan to eradicate poverty in this province. We need to build that movement. We need to force that onto the political agenda and make it so poverty is history in BC. Thank you. A lot of time talking to people um, accessing food banks. And we've seen that in the last decade, the number of people accessing food banks in British Columbia increased by 30%, over 30%. This is shameful. Shameful in a province as rich as British Columbia. Our next speaker is a health, science stu health sciences student at Portland University who works as a pharmacy tech. She has experienced unfair treatment. One thing the government can do is to make sure that all jobs are good jobs by raising the minimum wage to $15 per hour. And that's easy. They can do. They can do everything they want. But we just need to speak up what we need them to do. They can also strengthen up employment laws and more importantly, they can enforce them to protect workers from bad bosses. I have experience, really bad experience working for a bad boss. I was hired as a pharmacy assistant and paid just over minimum wage. I worked for long hours with no location pay, no benefits, no overtime. My employer even tried me to not to go to school and you know better myself. I needed the job and the experience, but I struggled to make my needs meet. I knew in my heart that I wasn't being treated fairly. It was scary, but the day came when I spoke up for myself and for my rights. And can anybody imagine what happened for speaking for my rights? I got fired. Yes, it was really a shame. But my, you know, why he fired me is because he didn't want me to speak up for my rights in front of other workers. Because he didn't want them to know that he's not treating everybody at his company fairly. And he's not following the laws. But I knew it was wrong. Even though I got fired, I went home and I cried for a couple hours. I prayed God, what happened to me, you know? And I lost my job. <laughs> but you know, when you are, you know that you are right from inside. You haven't done anything wrong. God is with you. You know, I got lucky. I got a random call from a pharmacy where I dropped my resume off a couple years earlier. Who saved a piece of paper for a couple years in a company? <laughs> But I was the, one of the luckiest one. So I got called from them and the company is unionized. Now I'm making a living wage. And have, union, and have union people to support me and making sure my company is following the laws and you know fighting for my rights. Yeah, and also I can afford to go back to school now and become a pharmacist. I am doing so.
report, it is time to protect workers from exploitation and bad treatment from their bosses. It is time that BC had a poverty reduction plan. Thank you for listening. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Kamal, for sharing your story. I've lived in British Columbia for just over six years now. And I, I am proud to say that our last speaker is one of my favorite people in this province. Someone that I've learned a lot from, and someone that uh, Anastasia and I really enjoy working with. Her silent strength and commitment to social justice is omnipresent. She's at all the meetings, supporting and working alongside all the groups. She believes in working together for the common goal of ending poverty. To know her is to know that she lives and breathes this work. I'm incredibly honored and excited to introduce the community organizer for the BC Poverty Reduction Co Coalition, the incredible Trish Garner. Thanks. Thanks so much, Paul. Thank you all for coming out today. It's so great to see so many familiar faces in the crowd and so many new faces here today. Oh, this is big and I appreciate every single one of you who came out today, really every single one of you in the crowd. So this is the end of our Poverty Free BC Action Week and I have learned so much this week and more importantly I felt so much this week. I have felt desperately sad watching a film set in England where a man is driven down by the welfare system and dies and knowing that's happening here in British Columbia. I have felt angry learning that farm workers earn four cents to pick one pound of blueberries here in BC. Yeah. And I feel the fear in the world that's pitting us against each other. Look at what's happening. So that we don't actually often feel for the personal welfare or the farm worker or any of the 600,000 people living in poverty. Poverty is not a problem to be fixed, but a wound to be healed. Derek Cook's words from Canada Without Poverty. And I feel this very real fear of so many of us not making it, of being really close to the edge, of barely making ends meet. So the cry of unaffordability is everywhere, but I'm afraid that shouting it is part of the problem. Unaffordability lets me worry about me and my family. It erases the fact that unaffordability is merely the symptom of a very broken social safety net that's been ripped out from under our feet here in BC. That's a very different problem with a very different solution. We need to pay attention, not to the individual and our affordability angst, but to the social. We need to look from me to us as community. We've forgotten that government is our community. Government is the highest form of community. That's where we pull together with the greatest capacity to pay taxes together, to take care of each other together. As an outsider from England, I know that Canadians are so proud of public health care. Well, that foundation is under threat, seriously under threat right now, and we need to defend it. We value public education to the core, too. Well, I don't have to tell you that that is under threat, too. We need to defend these public goods, our good, and we need to make poverty public in the same way. We have universal health care. How about we fight for universal poverty reduction? Make poverty public. If we truly do care, we need our government to take care of poverty here in BC. A poverty reduction plan is the means and it will raise incomes, welfare, disability, minimum wage. It will build social housing and bring in $10 a day childcare and reinvest in public education and public health care and defend indigenous rights, workers' rights, disability rights, migrant justice. But it is only the means. We cannot lose sight of the end. A poverty-free BC, yes, 
but more importantly, a world where we recognize and affirm each other's humanity. Fear is driving the course of the world right now, and we have to stand up against that. What we need to feel is not fear, or sadness, or anger, or hate, but love. We need to break down the divisions between them versus us. Whoever is your other in the them versus us, by actually loving them as we do us. We need to trust them, respect them, think the best of them, value them, value their lives. For the longest time, I've been hearing this phrase, all my relations, at the end of indigenous acknowledgements, and I've just been repeating it by rote. But I started thinking about those three words, and I invite you to think about them too all my relations, the power in that. Imagine, look around you, imagine if we actually felt that. Our world would be so, so different. Let's not get distracted. We need to face the challenges here in BC. Inequality is very real here, and it's gonna take all of us working together for a collective vision to show the way out of the deep hole we're in. But I wouldn't want to do it with anyone but all of you here today. This is a turning point in history, and when people ask where were you, you can say, I was here in BC. I was here in BC. It's going to be messy, it's going to be hard, but we will make this happen. We can make meaningful, real change here in BC. This is just the beginning. All my relations. This is just the beginning. Wow. All right.